Good morning, everybody. And happy New Year's Eve to you all. I don't know what you have planned for tonight or for next year. Rita Applegate will be partying, everyone. She will be giving everyone copies of her address. If you're interested, Well, Christmas is behind us, isn't that amazing? And the new year is before us. And it very well might be in 2024 that the Lord comes back. So we got, we got some work to do. Because there are a lot of people who still don't know him or without faith. So I'm hoping that uh, this last chapter of Hebrews, which we'll be going through today, will be encouraging for you. Um, it has a lot of very practical application since we've been given all this doctrine throughout. We're going to give, we're going to get some practical application as to how to live the Christian life and what Christian living looks like. So uh, before we do that, just pray with me, please. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank you for your word that's been preserved over the years for us and the special spiritual thing that happens when we read it. And how you enlighten our minds and you enrich our hearts and you strengthen our steps and you give us direction. And Lord, we so need direction, especially in the coming year when everything's in the air and there are wars and rumors of wars. And Lord, I pray that you might help us to be ready for your return, that we would have clean hands and a pure heart and we would have an active life that we would be sharing and showing the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, be with us now as we look into your word. Give us understanding. I pray that you might soften our hearts and capture our attention, that your Holy Spirit might speak to us something that we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So we are in the book of Hebrews. We're finally getting to chapter 13. If you remember, the theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than all of the things that an Old Testament Hebrew has been through in all of the law and Moses and the prophets and Joshua. Jesus is greater than the sacrifice that's given in the temple. Jesus is greater than the temple. Jesus is greater than all of those things. And he is the fruition of everything of which the Old Testament is a shadow and a metaphor. So we've been looking at that. We saw the warnings, the seven warnings in the book of Hebrews about Hebrew Christians wanting to go back to their previous life, wanting to compromise on what they know about who Jesus Christ is and go back to the law, back to that very well-established um, footprint that they came out of. And it would be so much easier because it's hard in that time to stand for Christ. We have it relatively easy here in the United States. Uh, you, you tell somebody you're a Christian, you start to witness to them. The worst thing you might get is a dirty look. Ain't nothing. Or a slap. That still ain't nothing. Or you might get arrested. That still ain't nothing. Because they're not going to burn you at the stake. They're not going to cut your head off. Not unless you're in another country. So last time we were in the book of Hebrews, we were in chapter 12, which we we're told since there is this great cloud of witnesses, we have this great bounty in chapter 11 of all of these who have gone before us, that we should run the race that's marked out before us, that we should take encouragement from those folks and live out our lives in a way that shows that we know Jesus. So this week, we're going to look at chapter 13, which is about faithful living. And so we're going to see lots of very practical things as we go through here. It's instruction on Christian living. How many of you think you need that? I want you to know that you can't do that apart from God having done a work in your heart. It just becomes a list of to-dos. You know, I got to do this, I got to do this. Oh, don't do that, don't do that, and don't do the other thing. It just becomes law-keeping if you don't understand that God gives us grace and he strengthens us, gives us a new life, a new heart, and a new mind. All things become new. And now, how do we live out that life? I don't know about you, but it's taken me to this very day <laughs> to get to this very day in my maturity, because it's taken years and years and years to unlearn things that I've been taught all throughout my life. Are you guys the same? 
I mean, I had things drilled into me when I was a kid and I had, you know, just basic neglect. And you pick things up from the TV and from the streets and suddenly that's what you adopt as a philosophy. And to get rinsed of all that and get a brainwashing in the most positive way is important. And so that's what this is really about. Chapter 11 were examples of faith, the hall of faith. Chapter 12 was this encouragement of faith. Now that we have all of these, boy, we're encouraged. And now we're going to look at the evidence of faith. If you are a person of faith, if you've come to know Jesus Christ as your savior, your sins have been forgiven, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, there's evidence in the way that you live. But sometimes we need some instruction, right? Like, oh, I, I didn't know the Lord wanted me to do that. Or maybe I knew, but I totally forgot. You guys forget things? Yeah. Good, we have an older crowd like myself. That's good. <laughs> Doctrine determines duty. Doctrine, understanding of what is true and what the Bible teaches is hugely important and it changes the way we behave. It should. Because if you have an understanding of something and yet it doesn't show in your life, then you really don't understand it. Revelation reveals responsibility. As God reveals himself to us and more of who he is, and since we're called to be his kids, that reveals to us a responsibility that we have to be like him, to be a reflection of who he is. In this cold, dying world, we are, we are like lights in this world, as Jesus has said. And so the revelation of all of the book is now going to come down to responsibility. There's this duty. There's this responsibility we have as Christians. And it's not a burden. It's not law keeping. It's fulfilling this nature that God has given to us to be more like him. We're going to see in here a love for people, which is the number one thing he's going to talk about, that contentment and confidence is something that we should possess as Christians, that we should have respect for leaders. We're told to have proper worship, and we'll, I'll explain that. And then at the end, there's a prayer and this wonderful blessing that the writer of the Hebrews bestows. Beginning in verse one, he's encouraging them, remember, let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. I want you to notice in this little section, it's all about love. Love in various spheres. It's all about showing what love really is. And the first is let brotherly love continue. So that's kind of the heading, if you will. Love is the title. It's this deliberate, intentional, other-centered life. That's what he's saying. And he goes, you guys are doing really good. Make sure you don't get lazy. <laughs> Make sure you don't forget to continue loving each other, right? Do you guys forget to love each other? I need reminders. My wife reminds me all the time. <laughs> she does. And, that, and it's a good thing she does because I need it. I need reminding. Let it continue. So he's not chastising them that they're not doing enough. But it's one of those things that we can get weary and well-doing. You know, we can kind of take for granted certain things, right? Mm -hmm. No, not you people. Good. Okay, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that you don't forget. I, well, I'm preaching to me. I need brotherly love to continue. I remember when I first became a Christian, I just loved the heck out of people. And they could say the meanest and most terrible things to me, and I would just like chuckle. They couldn't hurt me. I was like Superman. And then as I got older, it started to bother me. Somebody make a face. I'd be like, what was that about? <laughs> what, what, what? What did I do? You know, who knows? They might have a twinge in their back or, you know, whatever. Who knows? But suddenly I'm all affected. Why is that? Because I'm looking for some response. I'm looking for something back when I give love. But see, that's not real love, is it? That's more of an exchange. It's like Christmas. Look, I bought you a gift. Where's mine? <laughs> but letting brotherly love continue, it's all... Seeking after another's best good. That's what love is. It's not squishy emotion. It's not feeling lovey and huggy. It's, that's not love. What's love is I have a deep commitment in my heart to another's best good. That's what love is. Which means sometimes I need to tell you, you need a tic-tac. <laughs> and that's love. 
right? Or, hey, don't stand in the doorway because other people are trying to get through, okay? Oh, oh, I totally forgot. I don't know. You know, love means doing what's best in the interests of that person. And sometimes it hurts and sometimes it's hard to do, but that's what love is. So he says, let love continue. And of course, all of the other things like praying for people and helping people and um, finding out what their need is and how you can help praying for them. All of these ways in which we show love towards one another. And the first category he has here under, the, under this is not, it says, do not forget to entertain strangers. Okay, strangers are philoxena. Philoxena is a Greek word which means you have to be a lover of strangers. I love strangers. That's what it means. Uh, we understand it as hospitality. You find it interpreted throughout the scriptures as hospitality. It means that you find people that are on the outskirts and you seek them out. Like, you know, we had some new people here today. I will bet you that a bunch of you found these people and probably hugged the stuffing out of them. <laughs> because you do that very, very well because brotherly love continues. Rob and Rachel Day are here today. Yay. Along with Chandler, the young man. And see, when you see people that are not usual or when they're strangers, you should have a gravity to go towards them, to show love towards them. And the love of Jesus Christ should be overflowing from you to the point where you've got enough to give away. It's not like you drag your sorry self in here and say, somebody please encourage me. You and you and you and you and you, all of you. I need you all to love me and encourage me. Well, maybe we should do that. But if everybody did that, we would devour each other, wouldn't we? <laughs> well, what about me? I got it worse. Oh, yeah, well, I got it worse. Well, then I, oh, yeah, well, I got it. I'm sure you good people never do that. Have a competition as to who's got it worse. But see, that's one of those things that's like going down the drain. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Oh, yeah, well, I walked to school barefoot, uphill, both ways, you know. Loving strangers means when, when I come to this place, see, I want to make sure I'm prepared, not just prepared with my screens, but I want my heart prepared and I want to be filled with the spirit of God so that I can pour out in other people. And that's what a Christian life is, isn't it? That's the kind of instruction I need to be reminded of that I can't do it in and of my flesh because I'm selfish. You, you, you guys know I'm selfish, right? Oh, hearty agreement there. Okay. What about you? <laughs> When, when somebody takes a group picture and you happen to be in it, what's the first thing you look for? Yourself. You. That's right. And if you don't look good, it's a bad picture. Take another one. Don't tell me you're not selfish. Strangers. A lover of strangers. And it says that you should entertain strangers. But it doesn't mean to entertain strangers. Okay? It's, you know, you're not going to be doing this. What it means is that you're going to show love towards them. You're going to be sacrificial towards them. You're going to be others centered toward them. That's what it means. So be careful because sometimes the language can play tricks on you. You go entertain strangers. Yeah. Hey, thanks for coming to my house. I'll, let me show you a new dance I learned. You know, it's not, that's not that. It's looking for people that have needs and look to help them. You know, when you become a bridge between brokenness and wholeness, people will walk on you. And you have to be a person who's strong enough to be able to get walked on. Because you'll get walked on. Trust me. You trust me? Uh -huh. oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> In Genesis 18, he's referring to, and by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. If you remember Abraham in, in the book of Genesis in chapter 18, there were these three visitors. And it's interesting because I believe one of them to be a theophany because of all the explanation that goes on behind it. And two of the angels end up leaving. And he runs and he, get, he makes meat for them and, and milk. And by the way, they're all on the same plate, which is amazing that Abraham would have a non-kosher meal. But he serves a non-kosher meal to these guys and they eat it. And the one stays behind and has a conversation. Abraham had no idea who they were. 
and yet he showed them the height of hospitality. I don't know if you've ever had people in your life who have been angels. Angels, the word angel means messenger, by the way. You know, there are people that come into your life and they'll, you'll have a run-in with them and the Lord will give them something to say to you that may change your life. You ever had people like that in your life? Yes. You know, you, you run into them and, and they say something to you. I'll, I'll never forget um, uh, one brother who I only saw for a period of about a month and then he disappeared from the face of the planet. Uh, he was working with me temporarily. And I was a very young Christian. And I, I went to his Bible study and, uh, you know, he was going through the scriptures and he asked anybody if they knew what the scripture meant. And I just blurted things out because that's what I do. I blurt things. And he goes, that's deep. He goes, the Lord's going to use you, bro. I was like, you talking to me? Because at that point I had just gotten done doing drugs and sleeping around and being a knucklehead. And I didn't think God was going to use my life at all. I was just glad to, you know, make it to heaven. I, I wasn't thinking God was going to use me at all. But I remember that word. He spoke to me. I could tell you, down through the ages, there have been people that I've had brushes with that spoke into my life that really changed the way I see things. You guys have that? Yes. It's important. So we entertain those strangers because you never know who they are. In fact, Deuteronomy 10, 19 says, Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Actually, in the Old Testament, it was a command for you to love the stranger. You're not to treat them like an outsider. You're supposed to love them. I, I, you, you wouldn't know that if you went to Israel today, but that is the law, and that's what the law says. You are to love the stranger. And we're supposed to love prisoners. In fact, verse three says, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. We are connected to other people. And when there are people that are suffering, we should be compassionate. Our heart should go out to them. We should lend help. We should do whatever we possibly can as the Lord does that. There has to be a compassion for the forgotten and the neglected. Amen? Amen. That's something we can do in 2024. You see, these things are things that I'm going to be picking up this year because I'm going through this and I'm being reminded of it. So I'm hoping that you guys will do this with me. But remembering prisoners in their affliction and having compassion on them as though you yourself were chained with them. You know, they used to do that to Roman soldiers. They used to chain them together. In fact, they would chain you to a dead body and you'd have to carry it around. They do that for training. Uh, glad they don't do that anymore. In Matthew 25, you probably remember the sheep and the goats. This, the, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he's going to divide the people like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the goats on his left and he'll put the sheep on his right. And he'll say to the sheep, blessed are you, my father, because for when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Notice that it's included in this list of things that Christians do that are sheep, that are his sheep. And it's interesting because the Lord says this to them. And then they say, the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? Or when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Amen. See, Jesus takes it personally. When you do something for somebody else, you really want to connect with the Lord, connect with somebody, serve them. Show them love in all of the ways that are listed here. And that certainly is not the exhaustive list, but that's a good, that's a good start, isn't it? And it's about serving other people. If, you, if you're ever depressed, go serve somebody. Because depression is a very self-centered thing. Woe is me, me, me. It's all about me, me, me. Well, why don't you get involved in somebody else's mess? Because you get involved in somebody else's mess and you say, you know what? Mine's not so bad. In fact, I heard it said one time, if everybody took all their troubles and threw it out on a table 
and you had to pick some up, you'd probably pick up your own. <laughs> Jesus takes this personally. And this is what Christians do. You know, in the Muslim community, they don't do that. You have a lot of Christian organizations that are doing all kinds of great work. You don't have that in the Muslim community. Hey, if, if it's tough for you, it's because Allah wills. Oh, well, see ya. But we reach out and show love because it shows the love of Jesus Christ, which is what we're called to do. The third category he has here is magic, uh, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. You see, marriage in this society is not very well esteemed. You might think it's the worst in all the world, but it's really not. Guess where the worst is? Spain. They have like a 93% divorce rate. There are three countries that I never would have thought, and, they, and that's the top one. Portugal's another one. It's just the culture is completely shot. Marriage is not esteemed. In fact, America, instead of, instead of getting married, well, we'll just live together. We don't need to stink a piece of paper after all, right? Besides, if I don't like you, I can walk out. Well, that's not marriage. That's having a roommate. That's not marriage. Marriage is something that's sanctified by God and it makes you better. It makes the other person better because you can't leave. <laughs> you can't leave. I know because my wife told me. It's a covenant, you see, that you make with God. And it's, it's the reflection of who God is in its most perfect state. And it says, God created Adam and Eve. And when he created man, he created male and female. He created them in his image. There's something of male and female, which is the image of God, which male by himself is not. Remember, the Lord said, it is not good that man is alone. Now, some of you may have the gift of being single. Praise God, that's cool. If my wife leaves me prematurely through death, I may have the gift of singleness. So who in the world's going to put up with me? Because anything you say or do might get mentioned here. So that's a liability. And I realize that. That's okay. But if you have the gift of singleness, that's one thing. If you have a period of singleness, that's another. But marriage should be undefiled. The marriage bed should be undefiled, which means pornography, which means all of the junk that people drag into it contaminates that. I think you degrade marriage when divorce is easy. I think you degrade marriage when you have all of these other alternatives that you think are alternatives, but to be holy in Christ, you can't do those things. I, I think marriage is degraded when you make bawdy jokes about it or you make light of it. Marriage is to be reverenced. It's honorable among all. And the bed undefiled. In other words, you don't sleep with anybody else. You forsake all others. I, I chose one. It's going to be 40 years next month. So pray for my wife. <laughs> Marriage, not lightly esteemed or discarded. Just, it's not just a piece of paper, guys. It is the very image of God and is the best witness. It's not just procreation. You guys know that? There are certain things on the human anatomy that serve no other purpose other than pleasure in a sexual relationship. How do you explain that? It's not for procreation only, is it? It's for deep intimacy between two people so that you have this one flesh thing going on. We have young people here, I'll be careful. <laughs> and so, marriage is to be honorable. So you see, all of this is continuing in love and these are all aspects of how we love one another. That makes sense? Verse five, let your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Amen. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen. It's interesting, contentment and confidence. We just went through Christmas and so you guys are familiar with Scrooge, right? Scrooge was this guy who was all about his money, and so was the, his boss. 
It was all about his money, and that was his security, and he wouldn't even keep it warm in his own office because he didn't want to spend money on coal. And, you know, he was just a miser. He was just rotten to the core. But we see that he has this experience where he's rejuvenated and made new. It's the picture of the new birth, people, if you haven't noticed it, in A Christmas Carol. And so Scrooge is one of these guys who's just not content. He's covetous. He never has enough. It's the itch that can never be scratched. I don't have enough. It, I'm not good enough. My phone isn't new enough. My car isn't shiny enough. I, my house isn't big enough. I, I, I don't have my bank accounts not big enough. You know, it's not enough. You guys know what that is, right? Contentment is what I have is enough. Covetousness is I just want, I just want, I want, I want, I want. And what a miserable existence that is. Yes. It's like being hungry all the time and never being able to have a meal that satisfies you. And it's something we give ourselves to. That's why the scripture admonishes us. Let your conduct be without covetousness. In James chapter 2, verse 7 to 10, it says, he's talking about the rich. Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which by the way is an Old Testament passage. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are conv convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of, oil, uh, of all. So you understand... He gives this whole scenario in James of, you know, you see somebody who comes into your fellowship and they've got rings and they've got gold and they've got expensive clothes. And you say, hey, what's your name? Hey, come on in. Let's get you a nice cushy seat over here. And then you find somebody who comes in poor and you go, ah, you, you sit, at, you sit in the back or sit in the overflow room. Haven't you become a judge of evil thoughts? And why would you do something like that? You would do something like that for what you can get out of them. You have to be careful that you don't look at people as merchandise. Like a new person walks into church. Hi, how are you? What's your name? I don't ask them what they do because that's, you know, if they're a doctor or something, you know, it's just, you know, I can hardly wait to get your tithe check. I never want that to ever be an essence that comes out of me. If somebody says, yeah, yeah, well, I play the drums. You play the drums. We're going to put you right up front. We're going to put you right in. We're going to put you right in rotation. Yeah, I play guitar. You play guitar? We're going to put you right in, man. And you tend to look for people and you use them like merchandise. God, help me. That's terrible. You use people and you love things. You're supposed to love people and use things. But it tends to go the other direction. Let us not love things and use people. We should love people and use things. Another great person to talk about with greed and a lack of contentment is Gollum. If you're familiar with Gollum, maybe you haven't seen him for a while. Remember, he had my precious. He had, the, he had this golden ring that he valued above all things, and he couldn't let it go, even though it was causing him great harm, and he couldn't be around any people, and he didn't trust anybody. And he became very much like a Scrooge kind of character, didn't he? It's amazing how covetous will make, covetousness will make you that, and it'll build walls between you and other people because you start treating people like merchandise you start assessing their value on what they can do for you instead of loving them as to lord what would you have me do for them which is what we should be doing correct all right just let me know if i go off here guys in first timothy 6 verse 6 to 10 says now godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these, we shall be content. By the way, that's a statement of purpose. If I got food and clothing, I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to be happy I have that. Notice he didn't say a roof over his head or a new iPhone. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. It'll drown you in payments too. 
For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Amen. You know what that's like? It, it's, it's meaning that your reach exceeds your grasp. You know, you, you want more things than you can afford. You live above your means. And that's a tendency that we have to be careful of, or the scripture wouldn't tell us to be careful of it. Even as believers, and you notice it says there are those who have shipwrecked their faith from this. And you can get so tied up with the things of this world, you've got no time for the Lord. You got no time to have ministry. You got no time to be hospitalitous with your neighbor. You've got no time to give. You got no time to help people because by goodness, you know, you have to have two, three jobs to be able to pay all the bills of all the stuff you bought and is constantly devaluing as we speak. I'm just saying. I find it amazing that in a lot of third world countries, you find a lot of happy people. I went to Haiti. There are a lot of happy people in Haiti. It's an amazing thing. And they have like next to nothing. I went to a house. They didn't have a roof. And they were happy. How would you be without a roof? <coughs> You'd be inconsolable. Luke twelve fifteen, And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Your life does not, you know, like you can go on the internet and find some famous person and they always have a net worth. Ew. <laughs> net worth, you got a net worth? It's fictitious. And nobody ever gets paid with their worth, by the way. So whatever you're getting paid is not enough. Your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. Amen. Materialism, the American way. It's very quiet here today. So you find in a lot of these poor countries, you get people that are really, really happy because they've learned the secret of being content. You can be poor and happy or rich and miserable. In fact, I find that there are a lot of people that are rich and are miserable because they're always busy chasing after the next dollar. And that's their life, which is empty. Because our lives should be filled with people and ministry, shouldn't it? Amen. If it's just all about you, trust me, it's like constantly eating. It's not a good idea. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you. I didn't put that in there. <laughs> Whose faith... Follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. So I'm a little sheepish on this one. But it says here, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you. Yeah, that's me. That would be somebody like Carl or Johnny D or Mr. Randy. There are people that speak the word of God to you. And the scripture says that you're to show Respect of those who rule over you. Wow, it's a heavy term. I didn't put it in there. It says they rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow. Notice you don't follow everything they do. Follow their faith. Okay? Considering the outcome of their conduct. If somebody has a terrible conduct, you got to say, I ain't following you doing that. You know, I'm just not going to. But if, they have, if they, they're walking in faith, then follow that. You need to find people in your life that are examples to you, more than, more than just me, certainly. You need to find people that are walking in faith and learn from them. Because Jesus is the, mas the master shepherd, isn't he? He's the one that we're to follow after. And so I, I remember what Paul said. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, which I think is a great combination. Also in Luke chapter 9, 57 to 62, it says, for he, for he said to another, follow me. These are the words that Jesus said. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who were in my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. There was another guy in one of the, in Matthew who said, 
I just bought a team of oxen. Let me go home and try them out and just make sure that they're working properly and then I'll come and follow you. There are people that have many other priorities besides following the Lord. And the point is, Jesus doesn't want you to have those as the number one priority. He says, well, let me go bury my father. The thing is, his dad wasn't dead yet. It was making a long-term prognostication that, you know, I'll stay home with my dad until he dies, and then I'll follow you. You know, there are a lot of people who say, well, I'll do something, but it'll be tomorrow or after this event. And I'll do what the Lord would have me do then. It's called procrastination, isn't it? Are you just giving yourself an excuse to live in the flesh? Let me go home and bury my father. Let the dead bury their own dead. You need to live a real life that's alive. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate the Lord. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. In other words, he doesn't change. And do not be carried about by various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. You see, he's going against completely the whole Jewish regulations of what you can eat and what you can't eat and what's good and what's not good. And he's, he's trying to say, you guys, you're going to get all obsessed with, you know, does, does this have MSG in it? You're going to get all whacked out. It, is this real cheese? on this burger, because I can't eat it then, if that's the case. You know, you can get so fastidious about all of these things that don't make you any closer or further away from God. Right. I'm sorry, I'm a vegan. <laughs> Me too, I'm sorry you're a vegan, that's sad. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a carnivore. <laughs> well, good for you. You don't mind if I have a salad, do you? <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of carbs in that salad. I don't care. We tend to obsess on minor things that really don't mean anything. Why do we do that? It's pride. It's pride. It's just pride. Anyway, this is how a lot of cults get started, by the way, because you obsess on the minor things. And by the way, there are plenty of cults in Christianity. They call themselves Christians. But if you were to ask them these 15 key questions, you would uncover very quickly that they're not really Christ followers, because they don't follow what Christ says. Uh, the number one thing is, what about the deity of Jesus Christ? Was he the son of God, God the son? Oh no, he was an angel or uh, he was something else. Okay, well, you're not a Christian because you don't follow Christ. You've got a different Christ than the Bible says. So anyway, you, I, don't, I don't have this list made up, but um, this is a good list to go over. You make really big things out of really small things. And you completely, like the Pharisees, you strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel, Jesus says. Grace is what our hearts should be established by. Amen? You're not any closer to God because your hair is a certain length or because you dress a certain way. Or, oh my goodness, you wore a hoodie to church? <laughs> I'm playing with my brother Rob over there. You know what? It doesn't matter. None of that matters. Are you going to love people because they look good or because they smell good or because their hair is done a certain way? Of course not. You're going to love them because Jesus loved you first, right? Of course you are. Our hearts should be strengthened by grace. Verse 11, for the bodies of those animals, speaking of the sacrifices done in the temple, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. If for here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. You see, he said, just like the bodies of these dead animals were taken outside the gate and burned, they were burned in a place called Gehenna. Uh, the Valley of Hinnon, um, which is what Jesus uses as a picture of hell. 
where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. It's basically this dump that's on the south side of Jerusalem that, that connects with uh, another valley. And there are tons of bones. Uh, there was 185,000 uh, Philistines that were d destroyed in one night by an angel and, and they fell in that, in that valley. And so they just said, well, we can't use this land for anything. Let's just use it for a garbage dump. And so on the south side of Jerusalem, it's still there. Uh, they're not burning garbage anymore. They have different ways of dealing with it. But this is to say, we go outside the gate and bear the embarrassment of calling ourselves a Christian. Somebody said, you, you one of them reborn Christians? Why, yes. Yes, I am. Thank you for discovering me. Do you have any questions? Well, I wouldn't call myself a reborn Christian because Jesus said you have to be born again. So I prefer born again Christian, actually. So, I mean, you can get all technical with them, but who cares? It's an open door. Stick your foot in it. So we go outside the camp and we suffer the same shame and ignominy as Jesus did. Because we bear his name. And I hope you guys have learned to bear it proudly. It's easy to call yourself a Christian inside of church. It's a much more difficult thing when you're out there. Maybe you're going to be in uh, Times Square tonight. I'll pray for you. Make sure you bring a catheter. They won't let you in to use the bathrooms anywhere in Times Square. I'll just give you the heads up right now. Um, wear a bag in your sock. So what we do is we go outside the camp and we should bear proudly being a Christian. And there are people that are persecuted for sharing such things. So what? I want to be like the disciples, end up in prison. And they rejoice. And at midnight, they burst out in song because they're so excited because I have been counted worthy to suffer for Christ. That's like a big giant stamp of approval that it's real. Because who in the world would suffer for nothing? You know, every one of the disciples, except for John, died a terrible death confessing Christ to the very end and proclaiming the resurrection. Who would do that if it was fake? Nobody. You know, there's people, oh, how do you know the Bible's true? Would you die for a lie? No, you wouldn't. Neither would the disciples. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise, not a physical sacrifice any longer because Jesus already made the once and done, right? Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Notice this wonderful balance of, it's not just about your words. It's not just about your praise. It's not just about your worship. You have to end up doing something inconvenient and help somebody else. It's not just, your faith is not just about what you say. It has to be backed up by what you do. So praise God, and that's, a, that's the fruit of our lips. I mean, if you stand there and the worship's going on, you're like, I'm not sure you're doing it. Even if you don't have a great voice. How many of you don't have a great voice? I want you to mark these people. <laughs> You can sing quietly and you can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And that's okay. If it comes from your heart, then it's a gift before God. It's the fruit of your lips. And we're told to always do it. Well, it's just for people that can sing, right, pastor? No. It's something we should all do. So I would encourage you all to worship God by praising and worshiping who he is. And you're declaring his worth. And, you know, it's a weird thing for non-Christians to walk into a church and they're like, all right, so what's going on here? Everybody's sitting down, okay. Music, that's interesting, okay. It's like being at a club, right? Or it's like karaoke where you could just have a conversation with the person next to you, right? Oh no, this is worship. This is where we declare the worth of who God is and what he's done for us and we remember it and we bathe in it. Amen. And people are like, why, why are they putting their hands up? Or why are they covering their face? Why are they looking down at their feet? Well, because they're entering into worship and they're talking to God. Amen. Oh, really? I thought it was just entertainment. No, it's not entertainment. God help us if it ever gets that way here. 
It's a meaningful sacrifice, much like when they took an animal and they sacrificed it before the Lord. That is a sacrifice of praise unto our God, the fruit of our lips, for our praise and worship. But he says, don't forget to share. Maybe not your ice cream cone, but don't forget to share as well, because it's not just about your words. It's about sacrificing of your entire life, right? I got some needs. I got a list. Any of you want it? I didn't think so. You people. More teaching. Okay. You know, you can share. You know, I read something in the Word today. I, I read my devotion with Spurgeon, and it was really interesting. He said, blah, blah, blah. You share those things, and you have no idea how that encourages somebody. When we share the Word of God, we share the things that God is bringing us through. That's encouraging. Like iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens his brother. And so that's what we do. We exchange. In Luke 10, 33, it says, but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. You guys know the story in Luke 10, where it talks about the prodigal son, uh, not the prodigal son, the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan, first of all, there's a priest who walks by and there's a guy who's been beaten. He's half dead on the side of the road. He's naked. They stole his clothes, took everything he had, and he's unconscious. The priest moves and he goes on the far side of the road and goes around. And then a Levite comes up and he goes on the far side and goes around. And then a Samaritan, somebody of mixed breeding, somebody that's not a pure Jew, somebody that is looked down upon, comes up and sees this guy and he has compassion. You know why those other two guys didn't stop? It was inconvenient. Listen, if you're going to serve people, in 2024, it's going to be inconvenient. Amen. People are going to want you to do things for them when you have other plans. It happens to me all the time. People are going to want and need things from you, and it's going to be inconvenient for you. Are you ready for that? I, I hope you would all say, absolutely, I'm ready, 2024, let's go. <laughs> yeah, when you're going to serve people, it's going to be inconvenient, just like this case here. But what a blessing. Because he gets to show the love of God and he shows compassion towards somebody who's fallen on the side of the road. And you know the story. He comes, he picks him up, puts him on his own animal. So he's not, he's not riding in luxury. He's having to walk because of this guy. You know, can you imagine saying, come on, you can walk, right? I'll sit on the donkey. Come on, you can walk still, right? Shameful. He puts him on his own donkey, takes him to an inn. He puts him up and he gives the guy extra money which, oh, I don't know, man, that's, that's a little crazy. You're going to trust somebody? Yeah. He says, here, I'm going to give you extra money. I'm going to pay. Make sure you take care of him, get him something to eat. And, and here, I'm going to give you some more money. Make sure you take care of him. And when I come back, if there's anything else, I'll, be, I'll gladly pay it. Is there no end to this guy's compassion? Out of, I mean, in the middle of his schedule, it's done. His schedule's over. <coughs> And it's very inconvenient, but he goes and he wasn't anticipating laying out that cash. You know what? It'd be good to have some cash in your pocket ready to give away. Because if you're a servant, that's what you do. You get ready for things like that. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm not feeling well. One of you got me sick. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. We're back to that again. <laughs> for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. <coughs> for that be unprofitable for you. <coughs> Sorry. No, I'm, I'm really losing it in my eye oh, here. Oh, I'm sorry. One being sarcastic. <laughs> in her defense, you're right. You never know. I could be being sarcastic. No, I'm leaking. Obey those who rule over you. Why is that important? 
because they watch out for your souls and they must give an account. There's an accountability. You see, there's no such thing as having authority without accountability, unless you work in corporate America. And you happen to be lucky enough to have a job where there is no accountability. And that's not good for you. Thank you. Boy, you guys are all encouraged. The lady with the cane walked over to me. Wow. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> Round two. <laughs> Obey those who rule over you. Thank you very much, by the way. And be submissive, for they watch over your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy. Make my job easy, guys. I don't want to have to reprove you publicly. I don't want to ever reprove anybody. I don't like conflict. I'll do it because I'm accountable, but I don't like it. How many of you like conflict? You like conflict? I'll give you a little after the service. You tend to go toward it. Wow. I'll have to talk to you later about that. The scripture says there's a, there's a way that we show respect towards those in authority. And because we realize that they're under God's authority. Now, if they're not under God's authority and they start saying things to you that are unbiblical, by all means, reprove them. But if they're telling you to do something biblical, you have to understand that God often speaks through leaders and will speak to you things that you need to hear. I know you don't like it, but that's the way it is. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, likewise, you younger people submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You see, it's not just from the top down, it's accountable to one another. We submit to one another, right? Like when service is over and you race for the door and you're tied with somebody, you're going to take bigger steps, right? Or no, you, you let them go. Go ahead. It's all right. I got time. I don't really have to go. And we submit to one another because love is when you have a deep commitment to another's best good. It's not about me. It's about, some, it's about others. And you know what? If we all did that, boy, what a great world that would be. So submission isn't just in one direction. Ephesians 5, 20 to 21 says, giving thanks always for all things to God, yeah. the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You see, I understand that every one of you is God's kid. And you might have something to teach me. And so I always want to be open to hear the voice of the Lord through you. Which is why Bible study is such a cool thing because everybody, you should have seen the men's breakfast yesterday. <laughs> I asked a couple of questions and the, the room went wild. <laughs> I'm just talking about whether you'd make res, uh, resolutions or not. But we submit to one another out of fear of God because we realize that God speaks through other people, not just through your leaders. Capish? Okay. And then he says in verse 18, pray for us. For we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. It's interesting, um, if you have the unknown author who writes this book of Hebrews, he obviously has an intimate relationship with these people and knows them well. And he says, I'm not praying because I'm in a bad way or, you know, I got some sin in my life. Everything's okay there, but I want to be restored to you guys. So pray that that might happen, which shows a great humility on behalf of somebody who is an apostle who is saying, pray for me. That, that shows a great deal of humility, doesn't it? For you to tell somebody, hey, can you pray for me? That takes a great deal of humility because you have to give them some information to pray about. I think that's remarkable. James 5.16, the scripture says, confess your trespasses to one another. Notice it doesn't say to a certain person with a funny collar. <laughs> confess your trespasses to one another. 
and pray for one another that you may be healed. You mean healing's only going to happen if I pray for that, if I pray and if I have to talk to them about it? It certainly seems that way, doesn't it? Confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So, hey, you want healing of a certain thing? Maybe you haven't gone through the procedure. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. In other words, not going to God like the celestial Santa Claus and saying, I want a Maserati, you know. That's not a righteous man's prayer. <laughs> a righteous man's prayer is, Lord, what would you have me do? In Ephesians 6.18 uh, Paul saying, praying always in all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. You see, the people I pray for are the, the, you people. You guys are first on my list. The saints. Because I, I believe that God can work in your life and he can speak things to you and mold you a whole lot better than he can to people outside of this place. And I also have the ability to give you counsel and support and encouragement. So praying for the saints is hugely important. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. It's just another preacher's trick. He's not done. <laughs> First, in giving this blessing, he remembers the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, without the resurrection, we, above all people, are to be pitied if it isn't true. Although... Living a Christian life has tremendous benefits on this side, even if there's no eternity. But there is, which makes it all the more important. And he mentions that Jesus is our great shepherd of the sheep. And he's the one that we follow. And he's also mentioning that there's a blood of the everlasting covenant that has happened. Jesus shed his own blood. So all of that sacrifice back at the temple, it's over. It's done. You can't go back. Right. There's nothing there for you. It's all been done. Jesus rose from the dead. He was the sacrificial lamb. He's the great shepherd. And he's the one who has shed his blood for us once and forever. And he now sits at the right hand of the Father. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with this word of encouragement, of exhortation, for I have written to you a few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you. There he goes again with the rulers. And all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. So we learn a couple of things from this little addendum, this little PS. Because he said amen and then he says, oh yeah, by the way. <laughs> Preachers do that. But this is the last slide. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says this, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is, in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. You see, listening to all of this information, he says, listen, I'm going to appeal to you guys just for this little thing. I, I want you to pay attention. I want you to actually do something with this. I don't want you to just store it away in your, your mental library and close the page and walk away and stay the same. Bear with me, guys. I, and he says, I've used few words. This is 13 chapters. <laughs> he says, this is a short letter. That's like, this is a short sermon. In truth, it's the word of God. And so we should reverence it and pay attention to it because it is God speaking to us. It's not just, oh, that's nice information. I'm so glad. I went to church today. It, it behooves us to put something behind it besides just knowing it. And we're also given some hints as to the authorship of this book, even though it's not signed by anyone. We see that they're a, a close compat, uh, compatriot with Timothy, and that's kind of suspicious because it sounds like somebody I know. 
And he's writing from Italy. He says, all those in Italy greet you. We also know somebody that was put in a Roman prison there. So, and for this reason, some people believe that Paul was the one who wrote this book, but didn't sign it because he didn't want to offend the Jews he was talking to. Because he was a Jew of Jews, but what did he do? He went and preached to the Gentiles, which got a lot of them pretty bent out of shape. I'm just saying, could be him. And it ends with grace. Verse 25, grace be with you all. Amen. Amen. Because if you could wish anybody anything, it would be grace, right? So that's the end of the book of Hebrews. Don't clap. <laughs> it was a good run. It was. And I'm not so glad it's over. Next week, we're going to start the book of Mark. The gospel I have not taught on yet. I hope you guys have a wonderful day this last day of 2023. I wonder if you would consider resolving something with me. That you try to bless one person today. Something inconvenient. Something hard. Like a person that has to use a cane, walk up here and give me a you, you did it. You're, you're done. That's your one thing. God asks us all to do that because of the love that God has for us and because we're not really receptacles, we're conduits. God doesn't pour into you and then you, you only have so much. We're, we're conduits. And there's an unlimited amount that God can pour into each one of us if we're willing to pour it out. So I would ask you to consider, how can you add value to somebody else's life today? I'd like you to consider that because I think that's what the Lord would have us do to be obedient to the scripture. I pray the Lord sanctify your hearts this year as we move forward together. Amen.